Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. This is the BBC World Service, and I'm Maria Margaronis with The Y Factor. We're in a pub in Cambridge, and there are lots of people, mostly young people, sitting around. Somebody's eating a hamburger. There's a young woman over there with what looks like the head of a polar bear on her lap. Rather beautiful white polar bear. Is, is it a po- No, it's not a polar bear. It's a white wolf. Blue tongue and pink ears, and the mouth opens and closes. And there are some big white furry paws on the table and some brown paws. There's a squirrel at the end of the table with red ears and a, and a red tail eating a toasted sandwich. That's Lalia, or at least that's her squirrel name. Hello. Oh, what lovely ears. Yeah, this is a fabulous squirrel tail that goes all the way up your back. I found the furries a shy, part-human, part-animal tribe who get together in small groups and large conventions to play and express their animal fursonas. There are hundreds of thousands of them out there, but they're mostly hidden in the undergrowth of the internet. Chicken, eating a chicken sandwich, (laughs) not acorns. And how is your squirrel fursona different from your everyday human Not much, actually. Not much. (laughs) I'm hyperactive, she's hyperactive. Um, She's a little cuter than me, I should say. To outsiders, they might seem a little eccentric, but what they're doing is actually very familiar, using masks as a way to grease the social wheels. I'm Harlequin. I'm a a long-time furry. Uh, (laughs) When we live with animals or be with animals, we have to give them human characteristics to learn about them. And... We extend that even further. We'd like fantasise. Basically, if these wolves could talk or if these deer could talk and mummy deer's talking to Bambi and what would she say in imagining it? These are all anthropomorphizations. It's all this idea that you can extend and understand animals and have fun with it. It is, in the end, about having fun. The furries are projecting human qualities onto animals. That's what that chewy word, anthropomorphism, means. They're also claiming animal characteristics for themselves. People all over the world have been doing that since we made the first cave paintings. Now we give animals human thoughts and feelings in stories, nature programmes, advertisements and cartoons. And we claim their qualities through the brand names of cars and sports kit and deodorants. This week, I'm asking why. All across the African countries, there are many, many animal fables and quite often quite a surprising creature comes out as the wise and clever one. Michael Rosen is a writer and professor of children's literature at Goldsmiths College London. It's Mm. the rabbit who's the clever cunning one and it's the rabbit who plays tricks say on the lion who is quite often presented as a little bit dozy prone to vanity and if you in fact look at lions what do they do? They hang about most of the day they go hunting for about five minutes and then sleep for the rest of the day. At the same time, you have in the West African tradition, you have a spider god. So just as the spider can seem to create a world from nothing, just pulling out the strands from underneath itself, so you have a spider god. Now, when that travels, unfortunately, in some respects, with the slave trade to the Caribbean and to uh, the southern states of America, this Anansi becomes a Nancy man, a Nancy man who is a trickster figure. So suddenly the spider, from having been this great sky god, is now a bit of a rogue, really. Gods turn into animals, a shaman becomes a trickster. Once the barrier between humans, animals and gods seemed porous. These days we feel more stuck with what our DNA says we are. When did our way of humanising animals take on its domesticated, cosy, modern form? Harriet Ritvo, Professor of History at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology the development of pet keeping as a very common middle class and even more widely distributed habit is something that happens in the course of the 19th century. If you look at the uh, dog breeding periodicals of the late 19th century as well as later, but say in the Victorian period when it was all just getting started, you find that announcements of arrangements to mate, stud arrangements, were put under the headings of engagements and 
marriages. The 19th century, when humans built railways and factories and imagined they could have dominion over nature, even though the plains and forests still teemed with animals. Once upon a time, there was Goldilocks and the three bears. And where did she go? She got in, into the bear's house. Yeah. Were they at home or were they out when she arrived? She was out when she arrived. Old folk tales that tried to contain our fear of dangerous beasts were captured between covers and tamed for children. Then what happened? <gasps> a bear came in and, and, and a bear saw the Goldilocks. By the time you get to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, you have one of the most famous anthropomorphizers, if we can call it that, in the form of Beatrix Potter, who took the animals that she observed very closely and very beautifully in the Lake District and gave them all different characters and domesticized them. Now, that's very important, that people have projected onto animal life your ideal of maybe, let's say, a nuclear family. So Mummy Rabbit tells Peter Rabbit not to be naughty, otherwise he will get eaten, he will get put into Mr McGregor's pie. And it's, it's about maternal duties, that story, as much as warning children. Why use animals to do that rather than have a human family? That's really a question about symbolism and why human beings enjoy symbolism of any kind. You know, as consciousness has developed we found that we want to move from just simply wanting to be like an animal to want the animal to stand in for something, which is what symbolism is. And the extraordinary thing about symbolism is that it's quite clear that as human beings that when we look at a symbol of any kind, it could be a cross or a star or something, and say that is a symbol, we can hold at least two ideas in our heads simultaneously. Ariadne and Yasemi understand the difference between real and imaginary bears. And if you saw a real bear, what would you say to him? Nothing. I would be scared of it. Bears are a bit scarier than lions. Do you I think so? I think so, yes. Because they stand up, they roar at you, they can tackle you, they can hurt you, they can kill you. We tame wild animals in stories to make ourselves feel safer. But is there also something more fundamental going on? Bella Williams is a neuroscientist who works for the charity Understanding Animal Research. Is there an evolutionary reason for our habit of giving other animals a human face? I'm not sure in terms of evolution. I guess it would come down to something around people reading feelings into each other. So it would be something around the connection with empathy, with being able to understand other people, the way that other people are thinking. You look at their behaviour and you interpret what their thoughts might be. So the logical extension of that is that when you look at an animal or when you look at something else which is exhibiting human-like behaviours, then you would interpret their thoughts, but you'd interpret them in quite a human way. You don't think there's a, perhaps a survival aspect to it? Like if you're running away from the lion, you might want to have some idea of what you think the lion's going to do and what its intentions might be. But you might be wrong, and that's the difficulty with anthropomorphism, is that you're projecting your thoughts onto something else rather than understanding theirs. I asked Harriet Ritvo if she sees it the same way. Would it ever be possible for us not to see things through our own eyes, through human eyes? Would it be possible to step outside our own framework in that way? I don't have an expert opinion on that. My gut feeling is no, that we're kind of stuck inside our heads. So anthropomorphism is really one of the best tools we have for understanding the rest of the world, is what you're suggesting. Well, I would say that we're kind of stuck with it and to make it useful as opposed to simply distorting, we need to be conscious of it and aware of how it might be working to shape our understandings. My brother and I, on camping holidays, we used to lie on our backs in the mornings, particularly when it was raining, and observe the flies, ants, wasps, midges on the roof of the tent. And we used to imagine that they were racing. And then we gave them names. 
So the big fat blue bottle fly we used to call thugger, meaning that it was a thug. And then the very ordinary fly we used to call Joe Soap, which is, you know, like Joe Blow in, in America. You know, it's the name meaning Mr. Ordinary, Joe Blog. So we used to call that one Joe Soap. So Joe Soap would be racing against thugger. And then the little midge we would call Tiddlybottom. <laughs> OK, so it would be Tiddlybottom. And then we would do running commentaries. barn with Helen. We're standing in the pit and there's cows, brown cows, they jerseys. They're jerseys. Yes, yes, yes. Very tightly packed together on either side of us, others towards us. In the barn with the cows Helen Reeve is milking, bathed in bovine breath, anthropomorphism seems to fade away. Am I imagining it or are the cows telling me something with their huge gentle eyes? Helen thinks they do communicate with us. They understand how we're feeling as well, especially if, if we get a bit worked up about things. I think they can, um, they can pick up on when you're feeling stressed or if you're feeling a bit sad. Um, and they, they notice how changes you know? in people. How do you know um, that they're picking up if you're sad? They, they might just nudge into you at a certain point or they might, they might just sort of nod their heads or something. I think when you, when you work with them long enough, you get to know their little traits, and you can work out what, what they're up to. I, I, I could just be me. May I touch one? I have this tremendous... Dis- will, it, will it upset her if I touch her? I want to feel her. Um, if you want to keep your hands warm, the best place to stick your oh, hands is in there. Oh, so warm. What, between the udder and the... Right there, between the udder and the leg. Oh, so warm. And then it feels very alive. Yeah, it's a real... Um, and yet, we also eat them. How does Helen deal with that contradiction? Um, well, I've got my own herd of um, Dexter cattle, which are the smallest native uh, breed of cattle here in the UK, and I um, rear those for beef production. I name all of my females because I get, like I say, I get to know them as individuals, but I don't name any of the males because I know that eventually I will end up eating them or selling them on to other people for beef. I think there's this sort of subconscious thing. When you're, tra- when you're sitting down eating a nice beef casserole, you don't really want to be sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, there's Max or Clyde on my plate. <laughs> None of us like to think we're eating Max or Clive, and that guilt or revulsion about what we do to animals is also shaping scientific research. In Britain, anyway, dogs and cats are given special protection under the laws, so it's, you have to have a very good reason to want to use a dog in your research, whereas it's comparatively easier to get a licence to use a pig. Now, as a scientist, I would say that there is really no scientific reason for that. There is a political reason for that, and that's that people have cats and dogs as pets, and they don't want to associate their pet with an animal that might have been used to develop a medicine that they might need to take. So the use of a pig is something which they find less abhorrent. It's something that they can deal with more easily. Pigs exist so that we can have sausages and bacon. (laughs) Well, you, you could say that. But at the same time, pigs are a very intelligent animal and there is nothing really in terms of their physiology, in terms of the way that they behave, in terms of the way that they appear to think that distinguishes a pig from a dog to the extent that you could say this is food and this isn't, except that dogs have traditionally been raised as companion animals and pigs have traditionally been raised as food animals. So how do we know that animals experience things differently or feel pain differently? Can we know that? I think we can know that. There is an awful lot of research that goes into looking at how animals experience suffering. And we've discovered, for example, that you can tell if a mouse is in pain or is suffering by the expression on its face. This is really interesting. You can tell by looking at a mouse's face what it's feeling. Can you describe the different expressions you might see on a mouse's face? (laughs) I think it's quite difficult to describe the expressions that you might see on a mouse's face, especially if you're not familiar with looking at a mouse. But um, you look for things like bulges in their cheeks, that they kind of crinkled their nose, that their eyes might be narrowed. So there are certain expressions which indicate that a mouse is in pain or is really unhappy. So are those expressions like human expressions? 
I wouldn't say so. They're like mouse expressions, but they are a physical expression on the face of what the mouse is feeling. It's hard to imagine scientists or anyone a hundred years ago worrying about whether mice feel pain. Our need to empathise, to project our feelings outwards, the thing that makes us anthropomorphist in the first place, is pushing us to try and understand other animals better. The hierarchies we imagined in what some people still call the animal kingdom now look much too simplistic. Of course, there is a great difference between vertebrates, say, and non-vertebrates, although there are some apparently intelligent non-vertebrates. Octopuses are said to be extremely intelligent, although I've never seen one being intelligent, but other people have. Bella's one of them. Very difficult, isn't it? Because I I always feel very guilty eating octopus. I do as well. Although I, I love it. (laughs) And <laughs> you see, I never eat octopus for that reason. Because they're so intelligent. Yes. But I guess this is partly related to the anthropomorphism. You can't anthropomorphise onto an octopus, can you? It doesn't really have a face. It doesn't look like a person. It's very difficult to kind of project in that way, in the I... same way that you would with a kind of a cat or a dog. Mm. Yeah. But you, would you do research on an octopus if it had a... I don't think so. No. No. Inevitably, we're at the top of any hierarchy because, at the moment, we seem to be in charge. That doesn't make it necessarily right or wrong, but it's true. You say we seem to be in charge. Well, we'll see. I mean, I think we are in charge vis-a-vis, certainly vis-a-vis all the animals we can see. But we have a hard time controlling, controlling some kinds of small animals or microorganisms. You mean like bacteria? Yes. Viruses. Who may turn out to be you know, invasive, uh, certain kinds of invasive species, even insects. So you mean we may lose our place at the top of the tree? Um, If there's a tree. But uh, certainly we may not be uh, thriving in the way we seem to be thriving now indefinitely. Animals have been scaring us, feeding us, inspiring us since we first made those marks on the cave wall. We've humanised them to contain our fear of them, or to bring them closer, or to fool ourselves about the harm we do them. Now that our place at the top of the tree no longer seems so secure, is anthropomorphism also a way of reassuring ourselves that we are still the ones who tell the story, the eaters and not the meat? And we go, it's Tiddlybottom, and Tiddlybottom is closing on Thugger. And Thugger's going to get away here because Thugger... Oh, no, Thugger has turned back. Thugger has turned back. And here comes Joe Soap. Joe Soap's going to win this. He's flying. Is that legal? Is that legal? Oh, and Tiddlybottom. Tiddlybottom's flying as well. Listen to this. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.